My name is Aaron Lopresti. I've been a comic book artist, a commercial illustrator, and a writer for over 25 years. And this is my YouTube channel. Welcome to Talking Comics and Art with Aaron Lopresti. This is episode 19. In this episode, we're going to take a look at my storytelling techniques and thought process behind several pages to the very popular Infinite Crisis Dark Multiverse number one prestige format comic book that recently came out. Now this cover you're looking at is by Lee Weeks and Brad Anderson, and the interior art is by me and inker Matt Ryan. The book was skillfully written by new Batman writer James Tinian, and I sincerely hope I just didn't mispronounce his last name. I put a lot of work into the visual storytelling of this issue, and I'm excited to share some of my thought process behind the decisions I made. In my previous storytelling video, I discussed layout and page design. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at the thematic storytelling. So let's get to it. I guess the best place to start would be page one, but page one actually ended up being two pages. Let me explain. The page we're looking at here is the original page one to the issue, but after completing it, editorial felt it was not impactful enough visually to open the book, so I had to redraw it. We will take a look at the revised page one in a moment, but I think there are some interesting things happening here that I want to share. I know I just said this video is about thematic storytelling, but this first page is the one page in this video where I'm going to focus on layout. I opened the story revealing the dark multiverse with the Tempest Fugionaut looking back at it. All we see is the back of him in this opening panel. I had his feet drop down into the second panel to create a sort of a faux 3D effect, so in a way he seems to be outside the dark multiverse looking in instead of actually being a part of it. Now, even though he's on the right side of panel one looking back left, which goes against our natural reading motion, his cape actually helps carry us down to the left side of panel two, where we actually want the reader to go to continue reading. So we start reading panel one on the left and see the dark multiverse. We move right in our natural reading motion to see Tempest, and then his cape flows back down and to the left to get us to the start of panel two. In panel two, we see a low angle profile shot of Tempest. We are starting to reveal his face here. You'll notice in panel three that his horn is protruding out of the panel border, almost touching panel two above it. That horn placement helps draw our eye down from panel two to panel three, where we are now seeing a two-thirds facial close-up of Tempest. Panel four has two overlapping elements, Tempest's thunder stick, or whatever it's called, and his cape. Both of these overlap panel three, clearly letting the reader's eye know where to go next. In this panel, we have a straight-on shot, pulling back a bit to get a full reveal of the Tempest character. His stick flows down to the right and off the page, which should lead the reader to turn the page. So essentially what I have done here is a slow reveal of our story narrator. Imagine this as a movie sequence with one long moving boom shot. We start from behind and below Tempest, then move up to get a partial reveal of the character. The camera then moves around to, to reveal more of his face and then pulls back again to fully show the character. Now, as clever as I may have thought all of this was, it was far from a dynamic or visually impactful page, which is what we ultimately wanted to open this rather dramatic story. This is the revised version of page one and the version that actually saw print. As you can see, this is a much more bold and dynamic looking page. It has a big dramatic shot of Tempest Fugionaut and is essentially a splash page. Now let's go in a little closer and take a look at what I did here. I altered the first panel so that now we begin with Tempest on the left of the page looking out over the dark multiverse. I got the character reveal out of the way first since I knew this was only going to be a two-shot panel and I didn't have the space for another slow reveal. Everything in this panel is pushing your eye left to right and then down to the huge image of Tempest directly below. 
What I did here with the splash image of Tempest Fujinot is a bit unconventional. He is looking right to left and starts by carrying your eye back to the left of the panel rather than to the bottom right where we eventually want the reader's eye to be. However, as we move down the figure, you will notice that his fist that is holding his staff is moving back to the right and almost creating a neutral angle. Then I have his staff dropping back down to the right and off the page along with the energy trail, which then ultimately draws your eye to the bottom right and off the page. So, why did I do it this way? Well, in panel one, Tempest is starting at the top left and your eye is moving from there to the right. I wanted there to be a comfortable flow from the top of the page left over to the right and then back to the left and then back down to the right and off the bottom of the page. If I had placed the huge image of Tempest on the left facing right, there would have been no flow from panel one to two and the left hand side of the page would have felt too heavy. I also want to note that I used the light from his staff to create a dramatic lighting effect on Tempest, making the image and thus the whole page more dynamic and interesting to look at. In other words, a successful splash page. Let's jump ahead to page 17. Oh, and uh, spoiler alert. Now, this is the first time we see Blue Beetle after he has killed Maxwell Lord and taken over Checkmate. Here, he confronts Batman, and as you will notice, we get a big image of Batman in panel one for her obvious reasons. Now, if you look at Batman's head in panel one, which is at the top left of the page, and then to Batman's close-up in panel two, which is lower and to the right, and then to Blue Beetle emerging from the shadows in panel three, which is at the bottom of the far right panel. This gradual drop in the panel images from left to right and from top to bottom creates a roadmap for the eye to follow. Then we can easily drop down to Blue Beetle's head in panel four, and then over to his hand back to the left, which makes it easier to drop down comfortably to Batman's head in panel five, and then naturally straight across to panel six. But the main thing I want you to notice is Blue Beetle never gets completely out of the shadow. Why? Because he has gone over to the dark side, as it were, and only comes partly into the light to try and reason with Batman. The mistake I made was not having his figure partially covered in shadow in panel six. I'm still kicking myself for that. And Batman is always partially in shadow because, well, quite frankly, that's just who he is. In the second page to this sequence, we see the same theme carried on. In panel one, Beetle is partially in shadow. In panel two, the close-up, same thing, partially shadowed. In panel three, even though it is from behind Beetle, his entire head is covered in shadow. In panel four, Beetle is walking back into the shadow as he cryptically threatens Batman, who in panel five does not take too kindly to that. Beetle never leaves the shadows because he has no intention of going back to being what he was. He has committed to his dark path, and although he may, may step into the light to communicate with Batman, who is on the other side, he never completely leaves the darkness. Panel five is interesting in that we get to see both Batman's face and Blue Beetle's face in close-up but also get to see Batman's full figure. This is a Stranko-inspired bit of storytelling, and if you don't know who Jim Stranko is, for shame. I'd also like to point out that on these last two pages we just looked at, you'll notice that in a lot of the frames there's plenty of dead space. That space is left there for word balloon placement. Knowing this was going to be a dialogue-heavy page, you have to remember to leave space for the balloons so the major parts of your artwork don't get covered up. Now over to page 19 that begins a three-page sequence with Blue Beetle and Booster Gold. Nothing too spectacular in the first two panels. The first panel is an establishing shot of our location and then in panel two we move inside the room where the two are talking. It's a bit of a long shot so I can clearly show the surroundings as a, and as I often do I use the foreground elements to frame the characters. You'll notice in panel two, Beetle is sitting in a high-tech chair with his face in shadow. Panel three is Booster completely in the light, but in panel four, we see Beetle once again with his face covered in shadow. In panel five, notice the screen with Brother Eye overlooking the scene. Panel six, Beetle pulls off his mask for his friend Booster to see that he is still the same old Ted Cord. 
when he becomes Ted Cord for this shot, I bring him completely into the light. He is trying to convince Booster to join him, and I wanted to present him as the good Ted Cord rather than the now descending into darkness, Blue Beetle. On the next page, the theme continues. Here Beetle is addressing Booster, not as Blue Beetle, but as his old personal friend, Ted Cord. So I kept him in the light with no shadows until the last panel. Notice in panel three, Ted Cord's head is placed right where the pupil for Brother Eye would be. I did this to reestablish the idea that Ted is still tied to and perhaps even being controlled by Brother Eye. The conversation continues until the last panel, where Ted admits he murdered Maxwell Lord. For this terrible reveal, I drop Ted into complete darkness, again to reinforce the idea he has done something dark and horrendous. On the final page of this sequence, some interesting things are happening. In panel one, Booster can't believe Beetle committed murder. In panel two, Ted is re-emerging from the darkness as he tries to explain, but notice that he is behind his chair, in a sense hiding from Booster from a sense of guilt as he tries to justify his actions. In panels three and four, we have a split frame of Booster and Ted. Booster is fully lit, while Ted is almost entirely in darkness again. Notice that Ted's hair forms a devil horn on the right-hand side of his head. He's back to trying to convince Booster to join him. Is he sincere or the great deceiver? In panel five, Ted steps almost entirely back into the light as he makes one last attempt to get Booster to join him. Booster refuses and flies off, leaving Beetle alone and isolated and cloaked in darkness in the window frame. Later in the issue, Beetle asks Brother Eye what the real remaining threats to the world are. It shows him the Justice League. What follows is a five-panel sequence where the panels alternate between Beetle and Brother Eye as they diagonally move down from left to right. In Beetle's panels, he successively gets smaller while Brother Eye gets bigger. Booster is losing control and giving in to the logic of Brother Eye. As Brother gains more control of the situation, he gets bigger, and as Beetle gives in, he gets smaller. The diagonal drop of the panels also reinforces the idea that Brother Eye is winning and Beetle is losing and giving in. On this, the final page we'll be looking at, we see Superboy looking down on Earth at the new Superboy near his home in Kansas. The circular inset shows us what the original Superboy is looking at. We then go to a close-up of Superboy as he is contacted by Beetle. Panel 4 shows Beetle again mostly in shadow as he communicates his plans. In panel 5, Superboy goes evil. The shadows on his face are echoing that. In the final panel, notice Beetle's positioning. In the foreground, I have the open mouth of the anti-monitor armor encircling Beetle, and again we have Beetle's head replacing the pupil in the image of Brother Eye in the background. Beetle is about to merge with armor and Brother Eye. Both ideas are conveyed with his placement in this panel. Also notice he is almost entirely black in this panel. He is about to make a decision that will bury the old Beetle forever. I put a lot of thought and time into the art and storytelling of this comic, and I wanted to share some of it with you. I hope you liked the video, and as we come to a close, please remember to like and subscribe. Also, let me give you a quick reminder that my Garbage Man campaign on Indiegogo is coming to an end soon, so please go visit and back the campaign if you can. There is a link in the description of this video. Again, thanks for stopping by, and we'll see you next time.